Welcome back to the Big ML tutorial series. In this video, we'll be talking about evaluations, the Big ML resource that you use to help assess the performance of your supervised model. We'll begin by talking about evaluations in general, why you should evaluate your model, and some of the pitfalls you might encounter when doing so. Next, we'll show you how to properly split your dataset to perform an evaluation, and how to perform an evaluation using that dataset split or using a test dataset that you supply. Finally, we'll show you how to interpret the results of your evaluation and interact with your evaluation in the BigML interface. As we've seen in previous videos, supervised models can be incredibly useful things, able to make predictions about future data using only data from the past. Before you deploy one of these models into a production setting, though, it's probably a good idea to know what kind of performance you can expect from the model. And so, we will imagine we have two datasets, one for training and another for testing. The standard workflow is to create a model from the training dataset, and then use the model to make predictions on the test set and analyze the accuracy of those predictions. These latter two steps comprise a big ML evaluation. The first and foremost rule for evaluating your model is that one should never evaluate their model on its own training data. This is because we want an evaluation that gives us a good idea of what the model's performance would be in a real-world setting, and evaluating on the training data will give us an awful idea of what that performance will be. Why is this? Many models are very good at memorizing training data, and thereby being able to make perfect predictions on the instances that it sees in training. Unfortunately, memorized training data almost never generalizes to good performance on data unseen in training, which is what you really care about. Thus, if you evaluate your model on its own training data, you often get an evaluation that overstates the performance of the model, which will lead to a lot of frustration when the model underperforms this expectation in production. So we have a need for separate training and test datasets to do a proper model evaluation. The best case scenario is if you have training data that is distributed evenly in time. For example, if your training data is spread over six months, you can train on the first five months of data and test on the remaining month. This will provide a reasonable data of how well a model trained on data in the past will perform on data from the future. However, in the majority of cases, you will not have a dataset that is distributed in this way. The usual procedure in this case is to hold out a random subset of the instances as your test set and to train on the remainder of the data. Let's quickly visit again our diabetes diagnosis dataset, where the goal is to predict whether or not a patient has diabetes based on physiological attributes and the results of blood tests. Going to the Cloud Action menu, we see an option for a one-click dataset split, which will hold out a random 20% of our instances as test data. After creating the split, BigML assumes that we want to create the model from the training data, and so we are taken to the resource view for the training dataset. From here, of course, it's easy to create any sort of classifier we like from the Cloud Action menu. Let's create a one-click decision tree. Now, in the Model Resource view, we can go to Evaluate to evaluate our model. BigML automatically assumes you want to evaluate on the test dataset that you created as the other part of the training and test split. If you had your own test dataset, of course, you could select that here as well. Before we view this evaluation, let's discuss some of the pitfalls of evaluating classifiers. One straightforward way to measure the quality of your classifier's predictions would be to simply report the percentage of the time its predictions are correct, the so-called classifier accuracy. This number, however, can sometimes be misleading. If your dataset is highly imbalanced, so that 95% of the instances have the same class, you could reach 95% accuracy by always predicting that class. On the other hand, for a balanced dataset, 95% accuracy may indicate a competent model. Moreover, there may be one class you care about more than another. A classifier that identifies most of the people who have a disease but misses some of them might not be as good as a classifier that identifies all of the people who have the disease but introduces a few false positives. 
It depends on how you view the relative costs of false positives and false negatives, and this depends on your data and application. Big ML evaluations attempt to address both of these concerns, first by providing multiple metrics for goodness of fit, and second by offering tools that allow you to tune the classifier's predictions to a particular operating point, so you can achieve the desired trade-off between false positives and false negatives. Returning to our constructed evaluation, we see at the top of the screen the confusion matrix for the evaluation, showing the true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives for the classifier's predictions. On the lower right is a number of metrics that give an idea of the classifier's performance, and on the lower left we see an ROC curve, or receiver operating characteristic, that shows the trade-off between false positives and false negatives at different probability thresholds, which we'll get to in a moment. First, let's select true as the positive class, so the metrics and curves we see apply to this class, the patient's positive for diabetes. In the confusion matrix, we see that at the default probability threshold of 50%, we miss 24 cases of diabetes and predict positively for 24 people who are negative for diabetes. We may find this to be a reasonable trade-off between false positives and false negatives, but suppose we want to make sure we catch the vast majority of diabetes cases, even at the expense of introducing false positives. We can do this by lowering the probability threshold to make the model more likely to predict positively. If we lower it all the way to 1%, this means that the model will predict positively even if it only views the chance of a positive diagnosis to be as low as 1%. We see now that we catch over 90% of diabetes cases. Of course, this comes at the cost of raising our number of false positives to 70, well over half of the negative patients in the dataset. Similarly, if we raise the probability threshold to 90%, so the model must be nearly certain of a diabetes diagnosis before predicting positively, we can lower the number of false positives all the way down to only 4 albeit at the expense of missing nearly three-quarters of the true cases of diabetes. Again, there is no correct way to set this threshold. The right value depends on your data and what sorts of error you're more willing to put up with. You can also evaluate regression models. For regression models, we're predicting the value of a numeric field. As such, there is no positive class or probabilities, and so the resulting interface is simpler. We provide three metrics to indicate the goodness of the model's fit, mean squared error, mean absolute error, and R squared. These are fully explained in the dashboard documentation, but R squared is usually a reasonable indicator of overall performance. Selecting a regression evaluation we created previously, we see the three metrics compared to the performance you would get predicting the mean of the data or predicting a random value from within the data's range. As you can see, the model is much better than these two naive choices. In summary, we talked in this video about model evaluations and why you should perform them. We then discussed the proper way to construct a training and test dataset to get the most accurate possible model evaluation. Next, we created a training and test split and performed a one-click model evaluation. After that, we briefly talked about why proper model evaluation is difficult and how big ML evaluations address those difficulties. Finally, we showed how to use probability thresholds to tune your model's performance to take into account the relative costs of false positives and false negatives.